Welcome everybody to this Soapbox webinar, where we are going to be talking about our newest feature for our oral reading fluency assessment solution, uh, Soapbox Fluency, which you may have heard of, and the new feature is Prosody. And we are super excited to be here today to be telling you all about Prosody. Um, my name is Neve Bushnell. I am the Chief Marketing Officer here at Soapbox, and I am delighted to be joined today by two of my colleagues, we have Brenda McGurk, who is our Head of Education Product, and we have Mauro Nicolau, who is our Head of Speech Technology. Uh, we are also thrilled to be joined by Mary Isa from McGraw-Hill, and Mary is the VP of Product Management for Intervention, and she has actually been on this prosody journey with us um, since the early days of designing and developing this new feature. So, Mary, thank you so much for being here, and we're really excited to get um, you. Super grateful to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Appreciate it. Fantastic. Um, so today we will be telling you about Prosody, and let me just give you a kind of a quick rundown on the agenda before we start. So um, I will be handing over to Brenda shortly, and Brenda will be talking us through the importance of Prosody, the goals that Soapbox had in developing this new feature for Soapbox Fluency, she will be talking about the core use cases for Prosody as we see them, as we've developed our, our feature for them. And uh, she will also be talking about the data points that our voice engine will generate for teachers going back into teacher dashboards about Prosody. And Mary, as I say, will be joining in at different stages along that chat to share her perspectives and, and insights from McGraw Hill's perspective and as a literacy expert. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, then we will be handing over to Maro, and Maro will be giving us a demo of Prosody. So here's how it works. Here's what it looks like. Um, and as many of you who know Soapbox on this webinar will know, we are an enabling technology. So we're like the oil in the engine. We don't have any end user products ourselves. So Maro will be bringing you into a, 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 a not, so, not so ugly, not so beautiful demo environment that Soapbox uses four webinars like this and that we give access to our clients to, um, to show you how it works. And again, I think Mary will jump in every now and then with some of her own perspectives on what Mara is showing. Uh, the third piece, the third part of the webinar will be the Q&A. So um, we will be looking forward to your questions. And always, I think you guys know, always on these webinars, we get a lot of interesting questions. The Q&A is very, very busy. So feel free to use the Q&A as opposed to the chat for your questions. We won't be looking at the chat for questions because we get so many in that we want to keep them all in one place so that we can get through them in a, in a good order. And um, if we don't get to the question that you put into the Q&A, uh, email us at hello at soapboxlabs.com or just go to our website soapboxlabs.com and go to the contact us form or this get started form. We actually love having one-on-one -on -one conversations with people and diving into your use case and learning more about it. So if for any reason we don't get to your question or we can't get into detail with you here, just get back in touch with us and, uh, and we can dive in and, uh, and talk to you more about it then. Uh, let's see, other, other um, housekeeping stuff. So we're recording this and we will be sending it out to everybody afterwards. So feel free to share it with your colleagues. Um, we also always do a survey at the end of these webinars, quick two minute survey. What did you like? What did you, what did you learn that was new? What was interesting? What did you like to hear more about? What would you like our next webinar to be? We love that kind of feedback. So if you feel like it and you have two minutes, we would love your feedback on the survey. Um, I think that's it. Again, just it, for people who are just joining, it's the Q&A that we're using for the questions and answers. We won't be looking at the chat. Um, so just in case there are people on here who don't know Soapbox yet, I'll give you a quick two minute on who we are. So Soapbox Labs is a voice AI company. We build proprietary speech recognition technology from the ground up for children's voices. So in the education space, our focus is pre-K to 12. So we power loads of different use cases for education. We power every stage of the reading journey of the literacy journey for kids from phonological awareness all the way through to fluency and comprehension. Uh, we have a lot of clients in the language learning space who use our technology. We have clients who use us for to power dyslexia screeners, math, science uh, tools, et cetera. So a lot of tools and platforms in the education space 
in fact, by the end of this academic year, by the end of June, we will have powered 100 million learning moments for children. So over 100 million pieces of feedback to children using our voice technology. So that's very exciting for us. We are also a privacy first and an equity by design company. And equity is really fundamental to the fabric and the, the DNA, let's say, and the mission of Soapbox. So uh, equity, we build from the ground up to understand all children's voices of every age, accent, and dialect. And all of our clients, when they become clients of ours, they do a lot of due diligence on us to test for no bias because you cannot put voice powered voice enabled learning tools into a classroom that don't understand all children equally or give them a level playing field. And so all of our clients do a lot of testing beforehand and have come back to us saying they see no bias. So we're very, very proud of that. Um, we also were the first company in October last year to earn a certification for prioritizing racial bias and AI design. So, so boxes, we're, we're super proud of our, of our equity stance, of our equity focus, of our commitment to equity. And it's very important for our clients too. Um, we have about 50 education clients globally. Uh, McGraw-Hill is, is one of them. Scholastic, Imagine Learning, Amplify, Learning Without Tears, uh, I won't try and name them all because I'll forget some and get into trouble. So I think uh, I should probably leave it there. And uh, I think Brenda, I will hand over to you to get us properly started. Super, thanks so much for that, Neve. And uh, as Neve said, it's just great to be here today to talk about our latest feature. I'm gonna screen share now. And you guys let me know if you can see my screen. Are we good? Super, yeah. thanks so much. So welcome everybody. And as Neve said, we're here today to talk about how Soapbox is now powering Prosody. So what we've done is we've brought out a new feature that works with our existing oral reading fluency solution, our flu which we call fluency, quite simply. And uh, we're very excited now that we have the tools and the ability to objectively measure something like Prosody. And just as a little bit of context here at Soapbox, when we're designing anything, whether it be a feature, whether it be in the back end or the front end, or whether it's delivering back to a child or a teacher, we use a system called design thinking. And what that does is it ensures that the user and the customer are at the center of everything we do. So even though we have the most amazing, super smart people in this business, uh, it's no good if we're not solving a problem. So while we went through and developed the Prosody feature, we worked really closely with our customers, uh, one of whom was McGraw-Hill. So Mary and her teams there were just incredible in helping us. And we had other really generous customers who worked with us and gave us a lot of their time. So what we're going to show you today has been validated at every stage through that, but we still would love to get feedback from those who are on the call who haven't seen it before. Every day is a learning day for us. So please do provide feedback later on if that's appropriate. So we'll move on. Um, and so for the purpose of this conversation, we just want to define what we mean by prosody. And when we're talking about prosody in this context today, what we're talking about is the intonation, rhythm and pace of speech. And it's essentially what gives meaning to our words when we're conversing with others. And we have two key use cases, and those are oral reading fluency and language learning. So for the purposes of today's conversation, we are going to focus primarily on oral reading fluency with the knowledge that it, it maps across to other use cases also. So in the context of ORF, what we're talking about here is the prosody refers to the expressiveness and the pace with uh, that the student reads. So we know a lot of the time when a kid knows that they're being uh, assessed, they may think about that as a time test. And what you may get is fast reading rather than intentional reading. And what we want to do when we're talking about prosody is get to that intention. Uh, Mary, I wonder, do you have anything that you'd like to add here from your experience? You know, I just think that phrasing at the bottom is very important because there's a lot of focus, um, you know, in, in foundational skill instruction on that ability to increase your rate and a lot of focus on rate. And I think it's just that combination of knowing, yes, we wanna do that, but we also want to hone in on the intentional part of reading. And again, where that links to comprehension is really the key. 
So I think that's a great phrase to continue using with teachers and with students. And in, in the interest of honesty, I stole that phrase from Mary. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one to use. Yeah. It's great. Um, and then in language learning. So, for example, we may have a student who's learning English as a second language. Prosody plays an important role in speech comprehension and production. And what do we mean by that? We mean it's key to sounding fluent and being understood. And particularly if a student is speaking to a native speaker, how they phrase their language and pronounce a word can be absolutely key and make a difference when we're being understood. So anything on that that anyone would like to add? I think the only thing I think about, um, Brenda, when I think about this, the keys to sounding fluent and being understood is just that direct relationship to a student being um, their expressive, you know, language skills, but also who they're communicating with and their ability to receive that information, that receptive side. And again, an area we don't often focus on, we assume as long as we're being expressive, it's being received. But I think it's understanding both of those roles and how that plays a, an important part in speech. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Thank you. Uh, so move, moving on, as we said today, we're going to focus very much on oral reading fluency. And when we talk about reading fluency, we know that there is a journey that a student goes on their literacy journey. And this image here is going to be really familiar to, I would say, 99.9% .9 of people on the call. It's Scarborough's Reading Rope. And in the last few years, with all of the evidence coming out from science of reading, etc., a lot of the focus has quite rightly been on the left-hand side of this slide, at looking at the language comprehension and the word recognition, because without those foundational skills, a child will continue to struggle as a reader through their lifetime or an adult who's learning to read. These are the absolute foundation stones and it's right that they've gotten the amount of attention that they have. However, when we look at the right hand side of this slide, we're now talking about a student who's going up and becoming a more skilled reader. So their fluency is developing at this point. And to Mary's uh, point just a moment ago, we're looking at their ability to, it's the automaticity of word recognition but just as importantly is the text comprehension. Do, does the student actually comprehend what they're reading? And why is that important? Well, it's important because we know that there is that tipping point between a student learning to read, getting those foundational skills and moving up into reading to learn. And the reading to learn aspect can have a huge impact on our life, whether we're using reading to learn in our everyday life whether we're negotiating a form we have to fill in or something on a website if we're purchasing or condition, terms and conditions that we need to meet with something. Or we're looking at it for our academic life, whether that's in high school or in college, that ability to find new sources of information, to comprehend what we're reading, to analyze it, and most importantly, to utilize that in a way that's meaningful for us. This all requires that ability to comprehend and that link between prosody and comprehension is so important. Mary, I, I think you may have something to add here. No, I actually, you said it beautifully. That <laughs> I, I think that was a beautiful description of just helping the kid. It's you think about that being that bridge from those very early foundational skills and what's necessary in order to focus in on those higher order skills and a prosody plays a major role in that. So I think it's really, really well said. Super. Thank you so much. So again, something that's going to be familiar to everyone on the call here, the three components of oral reading fluency. And they're the three areas that we use to measure whether a student is achieving or at grade level with their oral reading fluency where they are. And those are accuracy, they're the speed and the prosody. And Traditionally, what we found is that accuracy and speed are the ones that are being most, that, I'm not going to use the word easy because it's never easy. If you've got 30 students in your classroom, it's not easy for any teacher to, to gather that information. But they do, accuracy and speed do tend to have clear metrics. They tend to be quite objective. And quite often there are automated or semi-automated systems to help a teacher or um to help to gather that, that data that's there. And where the problem or the challenge has lain usually is around prosody. It's harder to capture that information. 
and to to do it in a way that is driving some sort of data where you can measure that paucity. And as we said earlier, when we were working on this project, as we do with all of our projects, we reach out, we talk to practitioners and we talk to our customers. And the key challenges that we were told, there were varied and many, but we managed to distill them down to these two here. And Mary, I'd love you to jump in on this if you can. The first one is about simultaneously tracking accuracy and prosody, especially if you're doing that manually in observed assessment. And then the second is that a lot of people told us that they feel prosody can be highly intuitive. So the ability to take something that's a very natural and intuitive thing and put a number on it can be very difficult. Uh, Mary, do you have anything that you Yeah, like I completely add? agree. I was yeah. actually just listening to some students reading earlier today. I happen to be in a school today and listening to them read. And um, I think it's one of those things where we we all, you know, as you said before, it's not easy to get rate and accuracy, but we have a very objective way of getting that information. And I think for teachers, they can listen to their students reading out loud and tell you which ones read with expression and which ones read without expression. But to be able to really put a strong objective measure on that is, is very challenging for our teachers. And it requires time of sitting and listening to students read. And I think we can all identify, you know, we can listen to a voice and say, oh, that student reads with great expression, but then trying to, again, put a number on that or explain what that number means will give them a four on a one to four scale. What does that really mean becomes very challenging. So I think this is a way of trying to quantify that in a way that's easier for teachers to understand. That's that's super. Thank you so much for that. And speaking of challenges, we crazy people here at Soapbox decided to take on that challenge. And uh, so we're able to tell you now today how we can actually power the measuring of prosody. So we started off with a vision when we got together we came up with a vision and we agreed what it was we wanted to do. And we wanted to be able to objectively measure prosody. And we wanted to do that in a way that was as reliable and validated as existing measures are for rate and accuracy. As Mary said, you know, objectivity, be, being able to have objective, clear measures and something that would work and be perfectly balanced with those other two measures of rate and accuracy. And the solution that we came up with, well, we've built an automated, highly flexible prosody feature. And what this does now is it returns objective, accurate data points. And those data points can then be aligned to trusted prosody measures, whether they're your internal measurements within your organization or other well-known and trusted measurements, such as the NAEP measurement. And when we started off, as well as speaking to our customers and to users, we also went out and looked and did a lot of research about what was out there. How do you how do you measure prosody? Where do you even start? And the three measures we looked at were the one here I think that most people will be familiar with is the NAEP, NAEP measurement and having a NAEP score. It's beautifully scientific. It's well researched and it's well trusted. We also found the WOW or WOW one. And we also found Hudson Lane and Pollen. And what we did was, as a team, we looked across all of these different measures, we analyzed them, we broke them down, we tore them apart, we looked at the commonalities and the differences, and then we came up with this on the left here, the prosody data groups. So we said, how do we group these different measurements into something that we can say we deliver information back against that? And when we had done that, we then looked at our existing fluency feature. And we said, what are we already returning here? So we were really happy to see that we ticked four of those boxes, but there were two things we didn't have. So when we went on to de develop Prosody, we not only added the two features here for pitch contour and pitch range, which we see at the end here, we also went back and looked at how we were producing data for these other items, such as words correct per minute, word timing, pause timing, and speech rate. And we looked at ways that we could make it easier and clearer to pull that information in a way that was relevant to property. Um, I'm just wondering, does anybody want to add anything on this slide before I move on? Nope, okay. Um, so for anyone who's familiar with Soapbox Fluency, you'll see here on the left, 
we already deliver back all of this incredibly rich granular information and there's a lot of it everything from the information on reading errors that it takes to work out words correct per minute or accuracy percentages down to things like where did the child stop reading what was the last word pauses pauses hesitations mispronunciations self-correction so it's incredibly rich what we try to do is we try to get as close to how a human would behave when they're assessing a student but have that objective reliable data coming back and word of phone in confidences so to that now with the paucity feature we can now do three new measurements and those three measurements are expressiveness so how does a student's pitch vary through a reading, timing of punctuation and expressiveness of punctuation. So are there any questions or comments on or anything to add to this before we move on and look at some examples? Nope. Okay, so the three things we're going to look at now are the expressiveness, the timing and the expression. And the good news is that I'll be finished talking soon. And you're going to get to hear some examples of these uh, when Maro does his demo in just a, just a few minutes. So expressiveness, what we've done here is we have mocked up a way that we can show expressiveness to an educator. And our uh, head of UX, Declan, who was deeply involved in the product all the way through in the in the feature all the way through, uh, has created a way to visualize this within our, our demo. And what we're seeing here, this solid blue line that undulates on the top is showing us that the student read with a high degree of expressiveness. So the, there was good variation and change in pitch while the student read. And the dotted line that we see here on the end, that, as we can see, is quite flat. Intuitively, we know when we look at this, that this was low expressiveness. So it was quite monotone when they read that particular sentence. So that's one example. The next one is timing of punctuation. Um, I've always loved that book, Eats, Shoots and, Re uh, Eats, Shoots and Leaves, um, where it shows you the power of a comma and a full stop or a, a period where you can completely change the meaning of a sentence if you just put the, uh, the, the pause in the wrong place. So what we see here are examples of where we have commas where we have um, pauses, et cetera. So what we're looking at here, did the student observe punctuation that exists while they were reading? And it's something that we know develops over time through the, through the reading journey. Did they pause uh, for an appropriate amount of time or did they not pause at all? Or here we also have what we would term as an incorrect pause. So the student had a pause or hesitation where there wasn't meant to be one, and it may be an indication, an indication of something like decoding. And on the next slide, we will see expressiveness of punctuation. So here we're sort of tying together the previous two that we've looked at, and we're looking at expression, expression as it pertains to punctuation. So we know that we typically expect at the end of a sentence when we have a period, we kind of typically, typically expect the um, expressiveness to drop a little there. Whereas when we have something like a question or an exclamation mark, we probably expect it to rise or it may fall depending on the context. So what we're able to do is pull together all of this information there that we're returning and we're able to deliver back in our JSON files, not just timing, but also um, uh, pitch rates. And we can pull those together in a way that can form meaningful information. So we've looked at those three examples. I think it's really important to look back over this and say, when we look at fluency and prosody together, we're looking at a huge amount of information that's being delivered back. And what we're always trying to do is make that as easy as possible for the teacher. And what are we trying to do? What are our customers trying to do? They're trying to deliver back actionable insights, something that an educator can do something with it. They don't need an extra job. They don't need us automating something and giving them extra work. What they need are those actionable insights. And that leads us to how we map against rubrics. So if we have a look here, what we've done is we've provided some examples. And this was really important to us because what we heard from our customers was, let's make this easy for the educator. Let's look at how this could be mapped. And it was also how we were testing our solution as we went through at every step. Marrow and his team 
were doing an amazing job at pulling in use cases and testing them against rubrics to ensure that the data we were delivering back was accurate, objective and usable. So we see here a mock-up of how we might deliver that back to a teacher. And in this case, there's a student reading and they've gotten a score on a scale of one to five of four. So their prosody is quite high. Their expressiveness is up at a five and their phrasing and emphasis is at a three. And that com comes out to um, about a four. And the important thing here is, and Mara will talk us through this in a few moments, the teacher now has a very clear indication of where each student in their class would be. Is there anything we would like to add to any of that that we've just covered? I think um, when I think about this, what it, it, it directly starts having me think about what, you know, the usage for teachers instructionally and part of it's, it's not just getting the one score. And I like the idea of we're really talking about levels of expressiveness, you know, um, yes. it, it's that continuum. But more importantly, it's getting down to those finer details regarding expressiveness, whether it's phrasing and intonation and giving teachers more detail, which ultimately will help them focus their instruction for that particular student. We're not just giving you a single score. Here it is, um, high or low, and you know, go on and proceed. We're giving much more, I think, information to your point, Brenda, that's like that insight, insight that can help me take action on what I need to do next. Super. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. And I think that's yeah. it. I can see my, my scores at a high level and those that I need to delve into, I can find out what's going on underneath that, yeah. which is so important. So we've now reached the good news part of the uh, slide deck, which is that I'm going to hand over to Maro. And Maro is going to give us a demo of Prosody Working. And uh, you'll be able to hear some examples of kids reading and see how that translates into a score and into um, how it maps against a rubric. So thanks so much for that. Thanks so much for your, your input there, Mary. Over to you, Maro. Thank you very much, Brenda. And um, thank you very much, you all, for being here to this demo. I'm going to quickly share my screen. So I'm going to show you. So. Yeah, well, welcome everyone. I'm here today to sh um, present you the prosody, how prosody works in our demo. And in order to do so, uh, as Neve said at the beginning, we are going to use a user interface that our engineers put together in order to showcase and to visualize what our engine does. As Neve said again at the beginning, we uh, our fluency, softbox fluency solution is an API so, uh, service. So we basically send audio files, we receive audio files from customers, and we send back a very rich information, rich response regarding the oral reading fluency uh, assessment. So what we have uh, here is just a user interface that helps to visualize all this information. And people that in the audience that are familiar already with our demo and uh, the uh, Soapbox Fluency demo, they might notice that we took advantage of this uh, webinar to refresh a little bit our webinar, our user interface, and we have a little more, let's say, uh, uh, shiny uh, interface and with more capabilities as well. So, uh, you know, because of that, I will spend a couple of minutes also to explain the interface. Uh, again, and to highlight the differences or the, the, the new features. I also uh, um, browse over the um, or existing um, data points that we are um, delivering as part of our uh, fluency solution. And um, if I will also focus, highlight some of the latest features that we added to that part, to the standard uh, fluency solution. Uh, be, as well as, of course, the prosody, which is the objective of the today's demo. So um, I will start with the uh, interface um, and saying that we normally um, have on the left side, we have some preloaded examples. Uh, there are three of them and I'm going to show you today. So the first one we're going to focus is Pulse. And I'm going to let you listen a little bit of the audio so you know what we what kind of audio we are dealing with before we dive into the 
uh, type of uh, responses that we get from the engine. And please let me know if you hear the audio okay. Look, it is fancy and yak and yog. Fancy yak and yog run and run. It is lots of fun. It is nerd. Nerd runs and robs. Bam bop. Lots of mud. Nerd is mad. Nerd is sad. I'll stop right here because the, the, the passage is 30 seconds long. So I, I'll, I guess you got an idea of how the child speaks. As we said, um, I think prosody uh, for teachers, educators, and humans is very intuitive measure. Um, so what I'm going to do now, I will submit the audio. And you see, this is a live demo. So every time I hit the button, I will upload the audio to the server and the server will process the audio and you see in 35 seconds are returned in less than five seconds. So I get a response in less than five seconds. So the, the, um, the visual that you have here is the original or, or the data the, will display the data that we are already delivering as part of our um, fluency solution. And, but, and again, this is a visual, just a visualization what the engine actually returned. And I'll show this just one time to, to let you know what the engine returns, but uh, it, it returns a text file and with a lot of information or a reading fluency uh, related information. And we have um, scores at word level, at phone, at sentence level, at phone level, start time, end time. People, they are familiar with this. With our uh, fluency solution, they know this JSON file very well already. But what I wanted to show here is just the new data uh, data point that we added to this JSON, which is the pitch value. So for each word now, we are returning an array of values. And this array of values, basically, it's um, the pitch, the fundamental frequency value uh, every a uh, uh, fixed amount of time. For uh, this example, we have 10 milliseconds and it's returned at, for each word. The other data point that we'll be using for, uh, or we are using to uh, showcase and uh, derive our information about prosody is time since previous. This data point basically reports the distance in second or the, the time in second uh, between the current word where we are and the previous one. And this is very powerful when we have to search for extra poses, correct or uh, unusual poses in the text. That's the, the, the way we can do that. And another little piece of information that we make use when we talk about prosody is the punctuation, which is in the original text. So if punctuation is in the original text and then is reported again in the JSON, we can make use of that uh, information to um, decide where the pause should appear or where they should not appear. So where the reader should stop or not. As I said, this is very easy to be uh, read by um, a machine. Not so easy to be, uh, it's not very readable by humans, so I won't show it anymore, but just to let, emphasize again that everything you've seen in, or oh, you're going to see in the live demo here, is being derived from information that are in the JSON file. So nothing, uh, all the computation, all the, they say, conclusion that we're getting in the live demo are derived from that data and from those data points. So first of all, a little bit of um, overview of what we have here. So here, this is the, um, let's say original visual for um, um, oral reading fluency for the fluency product, product. And we have three, let's say, level of details here, as we um, said already during the previous part of the presentation. So we have a granular presentation, where is um, the level of details, where we report for each word, the confidence, how close this was to our pronunciation models, the start and the end time, and the phonemic breakdown with a, a score again for each of these phonemes. One 
for example, you can play this. And, and you see for each of them, you, you have score, you have phoneme, breakdown, and you have start time and end time. As you can see, this uh, child read quite well. There are no basically uh, substitution insertions. There is just an omission down here and some extra pauses. So the second level of details that we have is the summary down here, where we basically grouped all the arrows together in order to create a little summary for the, for the educator. And then the most important probably piece is that we squeezed again this summary into two very common uh, metrics or scores, like accuracy and work corrector minutes. In particular, in, there are several types of accuracy or several ways you can compute accuracy. The one we choose for this demo is um, we consider errors just omissions, substitutions, and hesitations. So everything else is not accounted as errors. Again, there are several ways of doing it. We, uh, this demo is just an example of how you can do things and just to show um, an interface that we built for our customers to have them to test our fluency solution uh, while they are building their own uh, solution, their own application around our engine. So um, finally, let's go to the positive visualization. So this is what, what, what I've shown so far is what was what we had already. Now the new part of the, and so there is a new visualization. Uh, the, the data I've shown before, the one in the JSON, so the, the, uh, the pitch array, the time since previous and the punctuation helped us to visualize and plot all this information on screen. Brenda already explained the blue curve, the pitch contour. And so if we now, um, over over the year, we have a little box that tells us that, that this sentence had an average um, pitch of 289 Hertz and a standard deviation of 50, uh, 48, 49. The, uh, whether or not this uh, standard deviation is above a threshold, then we mark uh, the sentence, the entire sentence as high expressive or low expressive. And we picked the threshold because it, it was, uh, let's say, very, um, co it correlate very well with our um, tests. But of course, our threshold that, uh, is not prescriptive at all. It can be customized to different customers' needs and different use cases. Look, it is fancy and yet and York. So you can hear that the, um, the child speaks with a lot of variation in their pitch. Um, and this is represented by the standard deviation that we measure. So this is the first, let's say, use cases, so expressiveness. And uh, before I go further, I just want to say that, again, here in this visualization, we also have the three levels of details that we've seen before. So the granular one, I was showing the expressiveness. The uh, middle level, so the, the summary level, where we group all the information together. And then finally, one score, as we did for word correct per minute and accuracy. We have one score that kind of gives an overview of everything else. But once we have a score, then we can always go back to the granular information. And as I was doing, playing uh, an example for the expressiveness or looking at this one where the comma was too, the pause after the comma was too short. Fancy yak and y'all go run and run. So the system detected that the silence between Fonzie and Yat was too short for the comma. Again, the, the threshold, we pick the threshold um, that be completely customizable. If you think that 0, 0 0.6 or 60 milliseconds is too, is an acceptable distance, we, that can be arranged by just shifting the threshold. And finally, the, the third use case or the third, uh, let's say, type of measurement that we can do is the intonation for each end of um, sentence. And for example, this one, it is not. So in this case, particular case, the because of the full stop, the 
uh, this, the pitch is supposed to go down a little bit, but the system detected that the, it doesn't either rise or fall, neither rise or fall. So we marked as a, as a let's say, uh, require attention. However, we this is again can be customized and can be ignored if customers don't like to emphasize this or can be uh, addressed either way. The important information here is that we can detect all these things and then we can decide whether to accept or reject. Another uh, little example I wanted to showcase here is the dashed line. As Brenda said before, this kind of indicates, and if I hover over the here, you see the standard deviation is below 26, our threshold. And so if I play it, no, it's mad. you can hear the, uh, the pitch variation here is more, uh, is less, uh, say, high, is a little bit low. And so the system picks that, uh, let's say, limited variation and highlight it here. Um, as I said at the beginning, the, all these data can be squeezed into a summary. So we have seven points, uh, punctuation errors. Most of the sentences have high expressiveness, so 11 uh, against one. And we have three poses. So the child doesn't stop very often. And this means phrasing an emphasis of three uh, with a three as a score and expressiveness as a five as a score. So quite high expressiveness, a little mid-level uh, phrasing score. And this is, can be uh, squeezed into or condensed into a rubric score. And as you can see, if we click on the question mark on the help button, you can see that more than 75% of the words have high expressiveness. The speaking, the speaking style expresses sentences structure and meaning, and the intonation sometimes is inconsistent, but most of the time, um, is is okay. So um, this basically, as you can see, we have three numbers here, and these three numbers kind of complete the overview that we have for to assess fluency for a child. And now uh, probably we'll go to a, a more interesting uh, audio. I'm gonna let you listen to a more interesting audio where um, the prosody is not uh, as high as the previous one. So I let you listen a little bit of the audio first. Look, it is Zam the dog. Pat, pat, pat. Sit, Zam, sit. Zam has, has lots of hum, ham, yum, yum, oh, wag, wag, wag. Look, Zam. Ten dogs. Okay, yeah. I guess I can stop here. I think you got an idea of the how the child is reading, and you can. I'll, I'll just submit the audio in the meantime. And the, the the child is a little struggling, is posing in several places. So, uh, and also we I don't know if you noticed, but there are another couple of let's say when the child reads. The, is uh, as a couple of self corrections. So he, he repeated the word twice uh, because the first time he was uh, they wasn't they weren't sure of the pronunciation. This is one example. I let you just listen to this one because I think it's it's a new feature that is not has never been shown before. Has has so I'll play the old sentence. Zam has has lots of. So uh, as you heard, the child uh, tries to say has and then corrects him, himself. So that's uh, and highlighted here. And uh, the fact is a self-correction means that is not counted as an error in the inaccuracy or in the assessment. We also have repetitions. We have some pauses here, but I'll switch right away in. So the, the accuracy is quite high here and the word correct per minute is also not super bad. However, when we switch to prosody, you can see that the majority of the sentences here have, let's say, low expressiveness. So the dashed line, and you can see a lot of pauses 
a lot of gray boxes here. So it means we have a lot of poses. And you also see that um, some of these uh, red boxes um, indicates that they have uh, some poses too short or some poses that are too, um, I want to, yeah, too long. Um, I'll start with the, to let listen to some of the examples to uh, highlight a little bit more. So an example of high expressiveness in this. Pat, pat, pat. Even though the pitch is kind of going down as it can be seen in the, in the pitch contour. Um, the, the pose, it's a little bit too short. The, the child is going, is not posing long enough. And we have a, let's say a low expressiveness uh, example here. Wag, wag, wag. Where the, uh, the variation uh, as can be seen in the standard deviation is really, really low. Wag, wag, wag. And another example of struggling, and especially for the uh, presence of poses. Is Them has, has loss of harm. And you might hear that at the, at the end, the child is unsure about it. So you see the pitch is rising a little bit and not enough to make a question, but it's kind of making a question. So the system detects that the pitch is not rising or falling. Again, the, this granular level of information is very powerful. We can go into, into the details, but I think the even more powerful um, tools that these data enables is the, to summarize the, the, the summary. So we can have at a glance, we have the, an idea how many errors there are, how many high versus low expressing of sentences we, have, we got, and how many poses we've got as well. And this reflects into two scores. Um, the expressiveness score is three out of five, and the phrasing score is two out of five, which results into a, a rubric score of two. In this case, 25 to 50% of the words have high expressiveness. So the minority of the words have high expressiveness and speech have some local words grouping. So there are pauses in the, the right places, but sometimes they are not in the right places. And I think this correlates quite well with what we just heard. And real quick, I'll jump to the uh, another example where, and sorry, uh, just one more uh, thing that you might have noticed here um, is that the accuracy and word correct per minute are very high, whilst the prosody is very low. So if we didn't measure prosody here, mm -hmm. we wouldn't capture the um that type of intervention that this child needs i don't know if mary you have some comments about yeah this. that's exactly what i was thinking i you know we measure a lot with rate and accuracy and to me this would be if we weren't measuring prosody this would this student would be deemed you know proficient at reading and maybe get no attention other than continued work on accuracy and fluency. Um, but what's so powerful here is we go to that third step of, of what kind of is the stool. You know, you have your rate, your accuracy, and you need the prosody in order to make it um, to those higher order thinking skills. And I think what was super fascinating too, Mauro, is when you see the detail of what the student is doing and why their expressiveness score is what it is, it also tells me as a teacher how I can help that student. So if it's intonation, if they're not paying attention to punctuation and really just, you know, in that instance, reading wag, 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 as if there's no commas in the sentence at all, um, that tells me directly as a teacher, that insight is super helpful to know how I can assist that student. You know, it, we don't want to revert to just a read with expression, what does that really mean? It really, to me, gives the link back to the teacher of how to adjust and guide their instruction with the student. So I think that's super valuable. You can see that. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we think that too. And that's why we we are so proud of this. Yeah. Um, yeah. This new uh, feature that we added to our softbox, flu softbox fluency engine. And um, Real quick, I'll just show a high prosody uh, example. 
very annoying. They had been, they had, they had been her favorite socks. Dad, Kathy closed her eyes. She felt blue travel across her jumper. It went up, it went up her neck and into I'll stop her right hair. Here and I'll it, submit this audio. And that, of course, there are, uh, it's very little to say here. I think the expressiveness is clearly quite high. The there are not many errors either because you remember we don't we can account only omission, substitution, and hesitation as errors. So accuracy and work correct per minute, the child can read very, very fast. And if we switch to fluency, you can see all the sentences have high um, expressiveness, as you can see down here. And seven punctuation errors, not, not so many as before, and basically no pauses in between the sentences. So uh, the, then this reflects into the, our scores. So four out of five as phrasing, because there were some, let's say, um, wrong um, or long uh, pauses here. And five out of five as, as uh, for expressiveness. And uh, we all can hear that the Kathy closed her eyes. Also, and the system captures very well the pitch rising at the end of the the word here, where there is a question mark. It's clear. Dad, that the child can render the question mark very well, and the variation you can see it's very high. And that concludes me my demo, um, and I'll give back the floor to Neve for questions. Mara, that was super. Thanks so much, you and Brenda and Mary did a great job there. So we have loads of questions and we've got about eight minutes. So quick fire questions and answers session is going to be. There are, as usual, when we do these webinars, there's questions about accents and dialects. So Mara, maybe you or, or Brenda, whichever one of you would like to answer, how do we, how do we, how do we cater to all accents and dialects? When we train our models, we all use the uh, largest variety of um, accents and dialects that we, we know of and that we can possibly find. And our model are uh, exposed to all these um, accents and dialect. And um, so our models can handle accents and dialect. So we do, we can, we focus on both sides. So first we train our uh, models, our acoustic models, to be aware, to be exposed to these accents. And, but on the other hand, we also test very thoroughly that what we train and what we, we thought uh, we can do with accent slide, and we are fair when we assess that type of audio. So it is definitely something we, are, we pay a lot of attention. We do exhaustive evaluation on, and we keep collecting data to ensure that we are not missing out any type of uh, both accents and demographic as well, two, two sides. Great. Uh, there's a question here. I mean, I think this has been kind of touched on, certainly, if not answered. Uh, what is the scale of the prosody rubric? Brenda, yeah, just... that, that's a great question. So just to be clear, um, what we did, we needed something to test our solution against. So we used the NAEP rubric. But what we did then, we created thresholds. And the thresholds were generated through extensive research through the project. So reading a lot of research that had been done, but we also did some um, qualitative research. We did a lot of um, blind listing and getting people to listen and say, did you know, say great sentences, did you hear that? So we, we, we used human assessors and we, we, we generated um, pitch ranges within the machine itself, within, within our engine itself. We correlated those until we were happy that they made sense. And um, obviously, we didn't we didn't create our own rubric. We took NAEP and we made a version of that so that we could present the information back in a way that's meaningful to customers or users and easier to interpret than you know a bunch of F zero scores or something like that. So I, I hope that answers the question. Does it or Maro? Is there anything else to add, add to that? I mean, just a quick thing is, is a scale from one to five and for the rubric and the expressiveness and the phrasing. Yeah. And we like to keep it that way. We could be more detailed with that, can be flexible as, as much as we like, but we like to be adhere, like very similar to the existing rubrics that are, yeah. are there. Yeah. Great. Thank you. 
And the important thing is, Maro said all the way through, it's flexible. We return the data. We can provide information on how you can and, and examples of how you can interpret that. But each use case, as we see with fluency, um, if it's an intervention program, you may count uh, self-corrections and mispronunciations as errors. Whereas if it's a straightforward benchmarking, you might go with the pure dibbles example of only three things are errors. So all of this is completely flexible and we are always happy to work with somebody who's, who's taking, um, who's onboarding with our systems to help them to, to figure out what's gonna work best for their users. Great, Mary, do you have anything you wanted to add to that? No, I, th I, mean, I think what's, what, I, what I think is important there is it is customizable. You are in control of what you want to count, what you don't want to count. Um, but I, I think that understanding that the work you all have done, I would say on the back end of the system, <laughs> to get us to be able to make those decisions on the front end is really important. Um, and obviously takes a lot of modeling uh, and a lot of data coming into that system. Yep. And a lot of testing. I know. So <laughs> we appreciate. <laughs> yeah, those guys are amazing. Yeah. Um, Jeff Straber has two questions. I'll, I'll pull out one of them here. Is volume part of the pitch contour? I know volume is not pitch, but curious, is amplitude volume important? Mara, it sounds like a question for you. Yeah, so uh, volume, uh, we decided to focus on the most, w when we started the, to design Prosody, we started to uh, talk to our um, partners, our customers, and we uh, made a list of the most pressing or the most important features for Prosody. And it ended up that volume was not one of the priority for most of our customers. So we decided to, to tackle the problem for uh, from pro, uh, pitch contour and poses. Apparently, poses plays a huge role in the prosody assess uh, prosody assessment. Yes, and so volume is not at the moment, but definitely is not is in our roadmap as well as stress, of course. And but and it's something we're going to work in the next iteration of our version of our prosodies. Yeah, and interestingly, a question that came up when we were doing our validation need was, um, how do you compare one child pitch to another? Is there a sort of standard? And we designed it so that there isn't. What we're trying to find out is that that individual student changed their pitch while they were reading, because my pitch might sound completely different to Mara's, well, you would assume it would. Um, you know, so th so what, what we're not doing is we're not benchmarking um, one child's pitch against another what we're saying is did that child change their pitch while they were reading so i think that's an important one just in case people have that question yeah absolutely um cindy has a question i'll, I'll read it quickly in reading a paragraph of good expression it seems that some that, that using some variation on how to end the sentence might be a good thing i like the cross sentence variation the student uses when saying it is nerve while not dropping pitch gets the student an error for the period. I wonder if there might be any future where cross sentence variation matters. Uh, I don't know, Brenda, if you want to answer this, or I'll take it. Uh, I'll take it um, quickly. We we shown an example of uh, what it's here, uh, what we can do with the data point, and any sort of analysis. We are not educator experts, of course. We we show what we think could be useful if other, uh, let's say, analysis, more, let's say, informed analysis are needed. Yes, the, the system can be uh, um, used for that. And of course, uh, with Sobox and Sobox Studio in particular, we can help through the design process and with the I, any step that takes you from the data points to the final product and the type of analysis that you, you want to have. I hope right. that answered the question. Yeah, um, let's see, we have time for one more. Uh, Jim, Connor, I, I assume you want the full audio file, not just a part such as one paragraph of a three paragraph story, correct? I think we uh, have... Go on, Mark. So, yeah, definitely we found that the, the longer the audio, the, so the more data you have to assess the child, the better. And that's kind of, I think it's intuitive. And in in theory, yes, you can assess, uh, you can use prosody on any length of the file. 
as long as you have the audio and the text, the, the accompanying passage that goes with it. But of course, in order to have a very reliable measure, the longer the passage, the better, the longer the audio and therefore the passage, uh, the better. Great. It is uh, six o'clock here in Ireland, uh, one o'clock on the East Coast, uh, whatever that is, 10 o'clock on the West Coast. Uh, I think we, 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 we promised we would finish on time. We have loads of questions. Apologies, we didn't get to them, but we can take them all and come back to you or feel free. Hello at soapboxlabs.com is our email address and we will respond and dive into your use case and chat with you about whatever it is you want to know about soapbox fluency, the new prosody feature or anything else got to do with voice enabling your uh, literacy or language learning journey or anything else that you want to voice enable for kids. So uh, thank you to my four panelists. You were wonderful. Uh, it's a really great session. And um, I hope everybody out there enjoyed it. And the recording is coming your way as well as a survey shortly. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>